I'm here with Josh, Jimmy Slash on YouTube. Josh, thank you so much for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. This is awesome. Uh, it's quite a pleasure. I've been, uh, as we were talking about right before we started rolling, I've been uh, watching you, following you for about two and a half years. And it all started when I was looking for that one special XL cold steel uh, folder, the uh, signature series Vaquero with the XHP steel and the serrated blade. And oh, uh, yeah, yeah it's yeah. awesome. That's a great knife. I you were the one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you were the one person on YouTube who had a video about that. And ever since then, I've been hooked on you. Um, where did you develop this love, this crazy love for these giant knives? You know, I, I started when I was a kid. My dad got me and my brother uh, 112, a buck 112. I think a lot of guys in my, my age range kind of started with the 110s and the 112s back then. I don't even want to say when that was, but, you know, Star Wars is about two years old at that point. So it was, <laughs> it was a long ways ago. But so about four years ago, I started looking for a knife for my uncle. And I was just looking at videos on, on YouTube, best pocket knife. It ended up being uh, the Benchmade 940. So I got him that. And so they kind of got this bug inside me to get out there and just get my first really you know, quote unquote expensive knife and ended up being a Benchmade mini grip. I think it was like 90 bucks, which was expensive to me back then, back mm. before I knew any better. And then that led to me looking on Craigslist, which is kind of weird. It's like a drug dealer <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or drug addict. I was, you know, trying to scratch up knives wherever I could at that point. And I found a guy on Craigslist was selling a Recon XL. And I wasn't even looking at that. I was looking at, he also had a lawman, an American lawman. And I was looking at that one. And I think I'd seen a birdshot video or something like that on, on the lawman. So I went and checked it out and he had that XL and I grabbed that thing. And it's, it's been downhill since <laughs> just the cold steel, the big cold steels. And the first video I ever did was on the four max. And after that, it was just, I was addicted to the, to those monsters. And, you know, you, try out that lock and you can't beat it up. And besides that, it being huge and indestructible, it's it just awesome. There's a lot of big knives out there, but just the combination of strength and, and size and just massive awesomeness. Just. So I think you and I are the same generation from, at least from how you located yourself in time in comparison <laughs> to Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> so what happened between the 112 days and the 4Max days? Well, I had the 112, and I, man, this is how old I was. I mean, this is how much times have changed. I would put that on my belt and wear it to school. <laughs> I mean, I was in third and fourth grade, and it wasn't a huge question about it. Yeah. And, but I think in the 80s, I, I may mean, have picked up a couple of knives. I remember my brother, we thought at the time was he uh, kind of ripped off a friend of ours. He traded a bunch of fishing, like really good fishing string for a Rambo knife and had the compass on it and the, the all the stuff in the handle. So that was the next big knife purchase. And then I, when I went in the service, you know, I bought some knives there and I got out and I started, you know, buy a hunting knife here. Nothing I was really using, but I just always liked knives. And I like knives even more than guns. And I like guns, but man, just having a knife, it just seems like, it's accessible. It's usable. It's, and I'm not saying this to any children in the audience, but you can play with it more than you can a gun. Yes. You, know, you can take it out, look at it, cut some paper, whatever you got to do with it. And so. It, yeah. It seems to be more elemental than a gun. Yeah. Yeah. It's right there. And you're the one kind of controlling everything right there in hand, as opposed to, I mean, I like guns, but just knives. It's just what I'm in love with. So. Yeah, I always say, thank God I'm not as in love with guns because that's a really expensive hobby. I mean, this is, you know, this can this can get you going too, but uh, but but guns. Yeah. yeah, there's no budget Kershaw pistols out there. You can't get it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's no $19, $19 to scratch that itch for sure. So uh, was it always the tactical knives? You said you you went into the military for a while. Uh, in the service, were you using knives? Uh, uh, no, I didn't do anything exciting or you know rambo like or anything it's just part of that whole mindset of being in the army you know you get guys with knives and guys with guns and you know we had stuff we'd strap to ourselves but i never went anywhere it's just 
just having it, just stuff you'd yeah. buy at the PX is probably looking back. It may have just been a budget, whatever. I don't remember what it was, but it's probably like a Gerber or something, re something really cool back in, back in those days, but kind of frowned upon right now that everything's hit pretty big. Yeah. Well, okay. So you, you get the four max, you decide to make a channel. Uh, who were you watching at the time? And, and what was, what was your thinking? Like, what, what did you want to get out of starting a YouTube channel? You know, I think like a lot of us, I don't, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of the people, you could look at the granddaddy of us all and that's nothing fancy, <laughs> Yeah. you know? And so I kind of got into his stuff and then I kind of got out of, not just away from his, not added like bad ad to just kind of away from that whole thing. And then weirdly enough, I found birdshot and it seemed like they were just having fun. Yeah. And I could go to just about anything or I can look at specs and I can look at the scientific part of all this, but they were having fun and I just kind of wanted to have fun with it. I wanted to have fun and it, I wanted to be more entertaining than I wanted to be scientific. And that's, that's been my point of view since and from the beginning. If you look at the description on my channel, I think it says so. I don't. It says I don't know much about <laughs> knives. You might know more than me, but you know we're gonna have fun. So yeah, I mean your your reaction to uh, getting a new knife is always positive, and 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 I relate to that. Even knives I don't like, I'm I'm extremely positive about it. It's like pizza to me. Like, and I'm Italian, and and there's there's a lot of bad pizza out there, but. Man, even the worst ski lodge pizza will have me, you know, at least for one bite. That's and, right. And, you know, so it's the same thing with knives uh, for me. And uh, so these these giant cold steels and and other knives, you seem to have sort of a tactical um, kind of a love for those overtly tactical and larger knives. Is that the uh, you know what what's that? You know, it's nothing. You know, I've done tactical things but nothing super tactical i'm not you know i'm not one of these what is x operators or i don't have you know my bug out bag and, and two in the car and one in my truck and i don't have a john wick thing buried under the concrete i just <laughs> i just like the big knives i just i mean i guess yeah size wise i'm pretty big so i guess but you know what the thing is i like small knives too i, I maybe i get away from that a lot your pocket chunkers yeah, pocket chunkers. I love pocket chunkers. I have a bunch of them. I've been, I, mean, I don't know where it's at. Where's that? You, um, I'm thinking I'm on video, but I'll show you since. You, this, actually, this, you are on video. We can record this. <laughs> this has been my most carried knife for about four months. It's the bug out. Okay. I've been you carrying did, this thing since I got it. So So you just said that in a recent video. And uh, I was astounded by that because that is like the smallest, thinnest, lightest knife that I have in my regular rotation and i know you for you know the opposite that's what i was originally attracted to your channel by and uh i, I love seeing that because i know that we share like at the very core that love that dna and uh um to see what small knives you like in a way you know justifies oh, yeah. This, yeah you yeah, know definitely. what i'm saying well, see, the thing is, well, I got the the regular uh, G, G10 one of these, and I did a video where I just kind of like stressed it out and tried to squeeze it and tried not try to break it like I do my cold steels or abuse it, right. but I went ahead and I tried to see what it would take, and it took everything. You know, I squeezed the mess out of it. I, I banged it into some wood. I pressed on it, and it, it worked. It worked just fine, and then came – so I figured out, and then I got this one, which is the, the limited edition one, and yeah. I just fell in love with it. So does so. that glow in the dark? No, okay. no, it's it, just that clear kinda, G10 stuff. Kind of looks like it. Okay, so I am I am very much not high speed low drag, but that's where my tastes are. So when I got right. my uh, bug out, I was like, I better get my Carta because you never know what's going to happen with this handle, <laughs> and obviously. <laughs> Uh, you know, nothing I do with it is going to stress it, you know, right. Cheddar cheese at the most, <laughs> That's uh, right, yeah. but still now I have it all set up with it. And, and it's an amazing little knife. Uh, and, and it has some of the same qualities of the bigger knives, um, that I love, you know, that it's, uh, something that you can put to work pretty hard. And it's also uh, a hard working blade, thin slicey and, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I love it. And I'm not surprised it's one of your prized pocket chunkers. Have you have you uh, witnessed at all the rebirth of SOG? Just curious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have the CLXR and the, uh, what's the other one? Like the mini, the, mini the one Q2, with that axis lock. The Q2 yeah, XR. I don't have that one. I have the, oh, I can't think. It's an XR. It's got the XR lock, and they've, they've made like five or six different iterations of it. But, yeah, I love SOG's new stuff. Well, Okay, so that 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 gets me to something that uh, is interesting about you to me is that you have tastes that vary from, you know, you you have a collection of Andrew Demko custom knives, but you also gravitate towards, uh, you know, I've seen you do glowing videos on twelve dollar Rough Rider knives. I mean, you're you seem to just have a love for knives. So so what is your um, criteria when you get a knife? How do you judge it? What what are the things you're looking for, whether it's twelve dollars or, you know, twelve hundred? You know, I want something that that's well made. You know, I'm not a whole I'm not like a steel snob, so I'm not going to run it through the gamut of chemical testing or anything like that. But I want something that's well made. I don't want a wiggly blade. So if I pull out a Rough Rider and it snaps open and it snaps shut, and, it'll, you know, I can put an edge on just about, you know, any of the softer steels. I'm not worried. Like you said, we're, we're not operators. We're going to be using it to open up our Slim Jims and maybe some crackers or something. <laughs> and, but I, I want it, I was, I want it to be sturdy, especially in the, you know, the thousand dollar range. Of course, I want it to be awesome. But even like a $12, like you said, Rough Rider or some Kershaw's and like some Kubis. There's some Kubis out there that you can get for 25 bucks that are just awesome. Yeah. And that's all I'm looking for. I don't want wiggly blades and I don't want failing locks. And it's kind of easy to tell at that point, you know, pretty quick what's going to fail on you. And that's, that's basically it. That's why I'm, like you said, I'm, I'm happy to have some $12 knife and I'm happy all the way up. Some, uh, you do some, pretty hardcore testing on some of the knives you get in. You have a, a favorite tray table that you used to bang on. I'm sure that thing's... <laughs> I'm sure I, that thing's I, I retired the first one. I got another one, so... <laughs> so also, you uh, you do brisket cuts. You get these giant briskets, and you will uh, take your knife, and you will you will do different kinds of cuts on it, and just to see how effective it is, obviously, before you cook it up and, and serve it. But uh, uh, tell me about the other kind of testing you do, and and is that um, for your own personal collection? Is that something you do or is that something you do for the channel uh, to let people know how sturdy or durable something is? I kind of do it for both, but I think I do it more for the channel now. You know, early on, I wanted to see, hey, what's this one and a half inch blade going to do? And I don't want to be morbid for your listeners, but you know, what's it going to okay. do, do to, some, to some meat, you know, to a piece of meat? And what's it going to do to a, a piece of cloth or something like that? And now that I kind of know, you know, I'm more informed about that. I do it so people will know, hey, look, you can trust this knife. Do you, like, I, I banged the mess out of this double safe hunter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, a, that was a knife you said would be a great first knife for a teenager. Yeah, yeah. I, I banged the mess out of this thing. And, and now you, people out there that may have had a question about, well, is it going to hold up or should I get it or is, what's going on with that? Now they know, you know, 35 bucks, you're going to pretty much an indestructible blade there. And that's kind of what I want to know. So if it's a, like I, I banged on my custom 8015 before the, the cold steel version came out, just to show them, hey, look, this is what it's going to do. And this is what it'll hold up to. And it mm -hmm. did. It held up awesome. So with the, the new cold steels, like the Scouts and the lights, like the SR1 light, and uh, the um, four Max Scout, uh, the four Max Scout has OS ten, I believe, and uh, the the SR one lights have eight CR thirteen MOV. Okay, these are these are steels that now seem like uh, antiquated to to st steel snobs. You know, people who expect at least S thirty five VN as their baseline, or right. or or D two if they're slumming it. So I'm trying that. <laughs> so. How do these uh, cold steel OS 10s and 8CR13 MOVs and the 440 that they uh, have on the new signature series, Chris, how do those hold up uh, by your experience? You know, I tell it, I've told it a lot on my channel, but growing up, my dad spoke about 440C like it was made in Valhalla. You know, <laughs> 440C, 440 carbon steel, son. That's what you want. You know, it was like 
Conan's dad at the beginning of that movie, just oh, telling yeah. him about the wonder of steel. That was my dad about 440C. And all of a sudden, you know, now it's garbage. I I don't get that. That's probably the basis for my not being a steel snob is I grew up thinking 440C was God's steel. And, yes. and, and but, you know, I, I've met, I've be, beat up Boss 10. I've beat up that 8CR13. And, man, I can't think of what kind of job you're doing where that wouldn't be a good <laughs> enough steel for you. I, I really, I think, man, maybe you're chopping down trees all day. I mean, that's what you got to do. But yeah, for any hard use, I can't think of how that's not going to work for you. I'm just too hardcore for HDR. <laughs> I need at least D2 to get it done. <laughs> uh, right. uh, like, well, think of it this way. Um, with the steels, with the 440C and your dad uh, talking about how it was steel straight from Valhalla. It's kind of like, are, are you wearing kind of the same style you were wearing maybe in your early 20s, your late teens? Or are you are you now suddenly wearing skinny jeans and like, or yoga pants or whatever the trend is now? Like, you're probably at some point good with what you got. And 440C, I've never had a problem with it in my 110. Yeah, that's right. It's like you're dating this beautiful, beautiful girl, and then you see somebody you think is prettier, and all of a sudden this person you're with for 20 years, that's not the one anymore. No, it's, yeah. she's still the same. She's It's still awesome. It's still good. It's good enough for everybody, but it's the S90Vs and the 110Vs yeah. and all these that are turning the heads now, and and I don't mind that. You know what? I will get down in the steel snob arena because I, I love M390. I don't know if it's just the name M390 that I love, <laughs> but I love it and I will I will do it. I'll sit there and compare knives and I love 3V. I don't even know why I love 3 I know it's tough, I bet it's going to rust on me, but I love 3V. Yeah, it sounds, it just in the shortness of it, sounds kind of badass. HCR yeah. 13 MOV is kind of trying to explain something. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> You're trying too hard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, I have, uh, I I've, have fallen victim to the, you know, I better, you know, oh, well, it's out in 20 CV now, so I it's time to move. I'm going to get this model now. And, oh, yeah. you know, it's so wasted on me for real. I mean, my, my favorite uh, in use and in sharpening, my favorite steel is 154 CM and uh, and CPM 154. To me, those are great steels. And for the actual cutting I do, they're way more than adequate. They, uh, I, I, I like to strop and sharpen and fuss. And I like the way they behave. And I like the way they look and feel you know i like the cutting edge i can get with them uh they are not you know 154 is not premium um but i will still pay a premium for something that says m390 it's weird oh yeah yeah no but yeah cpm 154 is gonna last you forever that's that's a great steal like you said it's not gonna you know take three years of sharpening school to be able to, to take care of that edge so yeah but but like you said just get down there and i see the next one you know, the, the bug out, I got three different bug outs, one in, you know, 3V, one in 20CV <laughs> and one in the S30V. So, so, yeah, so they, the, the 3V is the one that you baton when you're camping. You use that one, <laughs> that's right? right? Yeah, that's, what, yeah. <laughs> that's the one I make stuff out of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, your channel, um, how, how long have you been doing it? Like four I years? Four years in October. Four years. Uh, so how has your um, life changed? How has your collecting changed and your kind of your outlook on knives and the knife world changed since starting your channel i think i'm still kind of the basic guy that i was as far as what i like i've expanded a little bit on on how far what i know i don't not totally knowledgeable you know people you know, i was hoping you were like hey who's your favorite designer because i was just going to make stuff up i just you know i i, I have a couple guys i mean Oh, but, I know the answer to that. It's Andrew Demko. I oh, certainly. Yeah, there you go. If we stay on that, <laughs> we'll be good there. But I I don't think it's changed a whole lot, and I didn't want it to change. I didn't want to become the snob guy. I didn't want to be the guy who measures and just is real scientific about it. Because, like I said, there are a lot of guys that do it and do it really, really well. And I'm just I just never wanted to be that guy. It's interesting. I go to different people on YouTube uh, before I make a purchase for different things. I want the, the emotional reaction or the visceral reaction. I might go for you. Uh, I want the uh, specs and all that. I'll go to someone else. You know, I want a certain kind of analytical breakdown. I go to a third person. 
Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, and that's the great thing about all the people that are doing this is there's not just one person, one style that's doing it. You can find the guy that's going to break down the science of the steels. You can find the guy that's going to be able to tell you what, what angle your edge needs to be and, and the, yeah. the different attributes of whatever handles. And that's not, I mean, kind of interests me. I just want to know if the knife's going to work. I want to know what it feels like in hand. I want you all to know what I'll think about it and how my initial reactions and, and what it's going to do, do for you guys. Well, not you guys, but just the, the subs and stuff. Um, yeah, well, y you seem to have, uh, this is something I'm getting to, you've really built up a community uh, uh, on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, through your PIF, uh, your whole PIF program, Pay It Forward. Uh, you do a lot of uh, really community-oriented stuff. How, how has that grown? Where did that come from? You know, I started early, and I think a lot of channels do. I just I started doing giveaways early, and like a lot of channels, I, I did it to get subs. I wanted to share, but also, with, you know, hey, if I get to 50 subs, I'll do this giveaway. If I do 75. And then it kind of changed about, I guess, about five months in. And it, it was just, I've told the story a lot. So cut me off if, if you have heard it. But I have not heard it. So I want to. I had a, I have a really good friend of mine and his name's Eric Holiday. And he's, he's like, if I, if the only thing that came out of this whole channel was his friendship, it'd have been worth, that's how awesome he is. But so, but before we knew each other, we did a trade, a knife trade. And so I sent him the knife that he wanted and he sent me the knife that I wanted. But in his little package, he sent like some little doodads, like some little coins I think some mustard packets from Chick-fil-A. It was crazy. <laughs> cool. And just little things. And it cheered me up. I was having a crappy day. Sorry, I mean, bad day. And it just cheered me up. And I thought, man, if this little bit will make me feel better, you know, what if we can just start doing this for others? So I just started saying, hey, you guys who out there want something, you know, send me, send me your name and I'll send off what I can. So it started like three or four boxes a month, the first month. And then after that, it just went nuts because people started sending stuff in and I could send out more stuff. And then people started donating money. And so that was three and a half years ago. And the channel sent out about 1600 boxes since then. So it's been, it just blew up. It went crazy. We go crazy. It gets nuts around Christmas time. I think, you know, four or 500 boxes is about average of what we send out on Christmas. So what do people what do people get in these packages? You get a knife. I sometimes you get like a secondary like you might get a $30 knife and then maybe like a $10, $5 little knife. You get a thing of 550 like a enough 550 to make you a nice lanyard. The lollipops has become the standard for the thing. <laughs> Some stickers and maybe like a, a flashlight and you know a little doodad, a little EDC doodad. So a whole bunch of little so and, and then when they get that, do they pay it forward from there? No, I think the pay it forward part is just me paying it forward for what the channel has done for me as far as you know, give me a, an outlet to to and to entertain and to communicate with people. That's so that that's just kinda but it does. It ends up people pay it forward like uh, Big Red EDC. He just sent a humongous box of stuff. And so it just ends up being a paid for. It's like a, a cyclical thing where they give you something, you get somebody, and then they, they're like, oh, my gosh, this feels good. I'm going to give it to you. So it's not directly like they have to pay anything for it. It just ends up being a snowball effect. It's pretty awesome. So this is something that I have recently discovered uh, for myself firsthand, uh, how generous the knife community is, how trusting. Uh, you know, I've had people send prototypes. Well, I, I had one person send me three prototypes and, uh, you know, entrust me with that. I've had uh, uh, other um, friends from the knife community send me very expensive knives to hold on to for a while. And uh, I love the the trust and the, and there's like a flow people understand and knives come and go. And uh, um, the, the whole generosity thing is, uh, I don't know. I just love it. I, I, I couldn't imagine it four or five years ago. Uh, you know, giving away a knife. What, what are you talking about? Like I'm, I'm hoarding them. And That's now, right. now I love giving them away, you know, yeah. to friends at work or my brother or, you know. Well, I, I, I think I know what it feels like to get a knife. And 
and, and, and I don't mean to make it more than it is, but there are a lot of people, even in the life community that are, you know, lonely or hurting and they just want somebody that, that may be thinking about them, even inadvertently, like, hey, this whole community, this whole channel, this whole Facebook group is thinking about you. So you, this is yours. And I could just hundreds of people be like, man, I had the worst day ever. And I saw your goofy face on a package and it just cheered me up. Or I, you know, my, my plumbing blew up and I was down there fixing it. And my wife mm-hmm. said, I got this. And, you know, I, I like the idea of sharing knives and, but I like the idea of, and, I, and again, I don't mean to make myself, but the channel and what the people on the channel have done of reaching out and touching people and just bringing people together, which is the whole reasoning behind the Facebook group. I, I'd like talking to people, but I like people talking back to me. So it gives everybody a chance to talk about what they have, not just listen to what I have. So, so what, what kind of things have you um, gotten from the Facebook group? Explain the kind of, uh, I mean, do you gain knowledge? Do you gain friendship? What kind of, what do you get there? It's mostly friendship, but yeah, certainly knowledge. And you'll find somebody got a knife that you were thinking about getting. And th- like today, the guy got uh Spyderco, was it Python in or Python? Mm-hmm. And I, I thought about getting that knife and he said, yeah, this thing's awesome. And, and it's not just me going to a YouTube channel and hearing it. It's man, this guy, I trust this guy. I know we've talked about, we've talked about knives. We're talking about sick kids. We talked about everything. And you got this whole community over here that was originally focused on knives. And now all these different like friendship tendrils have, have connected a lot of people and have started even started different YouTube channels. And so it's just become a really cool thing that, that started as one thing and ended up as an entirely different thing. Uh, I hear you, uh, especially you talking about your Facebook group and how strong it is. And I know other people have very strong environments, uh, you know, uh, 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 groups on Facebook and I've always been resistant. I'm, I mean, I, I have a, a very, I, I've always been resistant because of the, I don't know, I don't know, I guess the conspiracy theories years ago. And so I've never gotten myself too involved in Facebook, but I keep meaning to, and I keep hearing these great stories. It is a great place for people to uh, you know, meet up in a different kind of way than YouTube or Instagram. And, uh, you know, especially for the giveaway thing, it seems like a, a great way to do it. Oh, certainly. Yeah. We, we, we do a bunch of giveaways and in fact, I'm late on a giveaway. I'm glad you reminded me, but yeah, I was just like you. I was, I, I was on Facebook for a while and then for, I'm going to guess about five years I was off. And this, the only reason I got back on was to start the group over there and just, reconnect or just connect with the people and ended up reconnecting with other people and men making friends. I had, I think I had five Facebook friends when I started this and it's just kind of gone blown up from there. So blade sports, Josh, you are yeah. now doing participating in blade sports. That's all I'm doing is participating. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. You will be dominating too. Tell, tell me about blade sports. Is it like uh, uh knife or death? Uh, the show. You know, I've never seen an episode of Knife Oh, Dead, my so Lord. You. Are you I know, serious? <laughs> I, know. I, used, I used to tell people in the service I'd never seen Platoon. That's how I feel uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great show. It's it's very fun to watch. And actually, uh, you you have um, you, you get some good sort of blow-by-blow blow criticism by the two judges, one of whom is Two, two Lamb, who is a Green Beret, badass, uh, oh, wow. Filipino martial artist, you know. Uh, guy who, who uh, but it's all blade sports. Tell me how you got involved in blade sports and, and what, what are they for people who don't know? I think I got involved when I saw big Chris, one of big Chris's videos went viral a couple years ago and he was on one of those crazy things that people do YouTube videos. And so I watched him and I started getting interested in it. And then last year I just went and took the class and it was just, it's just a lot of fun. And it's like the knife community. It's cool as far as what you're doing, but the people are the best part of it. You know, you, I've made friends and, and just being part of that whole group is awesome. You, and you have some really gifted knife makers, big Chris, you know, Donovan Phillips, you know, James Clifton, rooster fish. He's awesome too. And it's just chopping and, and it's intricate chopping. It's, you know, behemoth chopping. It's all kinds of different abilities and it max you know it's all in a timed event and 
I'm just not as good. I think I came in sixth out of a field of five last time. So, I'm, what's the, what's the class like? Well, you know, that's the first <laughs> time out. You're get you're you'll keep going up. But what's the class like? It's um, they have different classes, different places, but it's an eight hour class where you just go, and the instructor will run through all the different the different events that you're going to be tested on, and they're just it's a huge thing about safety. I mean, just teaching safety, and it's always in the back of everybody's mind because you got these, you know, pound and a half knives that you're swinging like a madman and you got to be real careful that you know what you're doing because they're razor sharp. And so the class is just, you go through the event and then they put you through basically a blade sports event at the end of the class. So they, they give you practice and they, they show you what to do on each event and a lot, a lot of practice to the point where it's, it gets exhausting just taking the class as much chopping as you're doing. And so they, they send you through the event at the end, and that was that was pretty much it. It was it was an eight hour day, and it was fun. It was good. I had a really good instructor. And so does that mean now you can just go and compete in in open tournaments, that kind of thing? Yeah, right. Whatever blade sports sanctioned event is out there, I can go. I can go and do any of them. So, so what makes a good blade sports knife? I had the one I was using was a big Chris and it wasn't made for me, but it was, it was really good. His stuff is awesome. And if you can get one that's made for your hand, which is what I'm trying to get through Donovan Phillips right now, one that's a little bit, because the, if you look at the blade sports guys, they're a little bit taller and I'm, I'm, if I stretch my neck, I'm about five foot eight. <laughs> and so these guys, you know, big Chris, I think is about six foot seven. Wow. So he's got a little bit of a different kind of leverage than I do <laughs> on the various chopping things. So I'm having one that's kind of going to help me a little bit, but you want something that really that you don't get tired swinging. So if, you know, if you're a female or, you know, maybe a lighter guy, you don't want something that's two pounds of, of metal. So you want something, you want something that fits your hand. And because of the different precision events, you want something that you can, you can flick with enough strength and precision to get through those straws and the different dowels and stuff. So when you say flick, you mean kind of like a drumstick? Yeah, just like a yeah, it's like a whip, right? Kind right. of thing. So uh, okay, so that's why when I see um, blade sports knives, the the angle of attack on the blade is kind of extreme. It looks like a like a bolo or something, uh, except it's kind of cleaver shaped. Yeah, it's just a big long, you know, foot long cleaver, whatever, ten inch cleaver. And, yeah, and they keep that butt end for safety reasons. There's no sharp ends on it. It's just all tool is what they're trying. And that's what they're kind of trying to show. If you go to the blade sports website, that it's a tool and that knives are tools. And so how many of those do you have? Do you have a, can you justify a huge collection of those because you compete? <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> I sold my big Chris to, to get this Donovan Phillips one made. So all I have are a couple of production pseudo blade sports that I practice with. I actually have one custom that I bought. That's not, it's kind of a blade sports, but it's not sanctioned. So I just use them to practice and keep my wrists in, in shape. Okay. So um, this is going to be kind of a personal question, uh, but how big is your collection? Like, I mean, you seem to have a lot of knives. We all do. And there's always that, um, well, there's always that question when, when you're watching someone's channel and they they can they pull something out for a comparison you're like oh i didn't know they had that oh i wonder what his collection is <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have like what's what's the scope i say between probably four and five hundred four and five hundred nine or something like that nothing outrageous but you know enough so folders or folders or or, or everything yeah that's what they everything i would say probably 80% folders. 80%. Folders. But I have a bunch of good, really good fixed blades too. I like fixed blades. I don't do a lot of them on the channel because a lot of people aren't as excited about them. And a lot of the fixed blade stuff is going out in the woods and chopping stuff. And I don't have any woods, but so but what, I love fixed blades. Well, what, what kind of fixed blades? I know what kind of folders you're into. What what kind of fixed blades do you gravitate towards? Oh, the same thing. Just the same thing as the folders I'm into. <laughs> Burly and aggressive. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. I have a bunch of uh, – I have the JX5 by Bark River. I love that thing. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but was, I figured it's got a really cool name, but I don't remember what it is. It's, it's, it, it, it's a giant Bowie with a, with a long handle designed by um, – uh, uh, the guy who does um, 
prepared mine 101 has done. yeah exactly him yeah that's his knife Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he makes he makes some cool designs. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. That one was pretty exclusive. I know that that was a short run and not too many of those were made. Yeah, it snuck up on me. In fact, it was one of those things where you you think, well, I got to sign up for this. It's coming out. So I pre-ordered just by signing up for it. I didn't pay for it. And then I bought a, a Carruthers Behemoth Chopper. I don't know if you heard oh, of uh, the Carruthers stuff. Yes. But I think it was... And I'm, I'm not trying to brag. It was like 650 bucks. <laughs> so I, I sold a bunch of knives and got my 650 and got the behemoth chopper. And with the Carruthers stuff, at least at that point, you had to go on blade form and just get to go. I'm in, you know, you and hope that 25 guys weren't before you. Right. So I got in on that one, got that one. And I swear the next day or so they're like, Bark River sends me a note. Hey, your JX five is, is ready. You know, send us 450 bucks or whatever it was. <laughs> so I was scrambling again. So but, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah. Well, so, uh, okay, with all these knives and you have a channel, so you, you have to, some of the knives you get in have to be for the channel, probably things that you're not thinking of collecting. But uh, so how does that work? The flow of knives through and then do you, do you, sell them off or do they go into the permanent collection uh, after you make a video? How does that work? I think, I think one of the problems of my channel, I don't know if it's a problem is that I review stuff that I like a lot and I don't end up buying a lot of things just for the channel. I do sometimes and sometimes they'll be sent to me and I'll, and I'll review them. But a lot of times I'm just like, Oh yeah, I need this one and I need everybody to see that I like it or I see that I bought it or, but yeah, if it's something that I get in and I kind of like, or it's just, eh, I'll stick that in PIF. I, you know, I do a giveaway with it. I give away a lot of the, the stuff that comes in for that. And of course, you know, I'll send, I'll sell it too if, if I'm needing to, to reimburse or get some more knives or something. So when, when big things come out, uh, big aggressive things come out, like when the shock came out, I looked to your channel <laughs> and you, you got it. And uh, uh, it was good to see your reaction. Do you still have that knife? Yes, I do. Uh, we're I talking about it. the CRKT shock. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I still have it. It's one of my favorites. It's one of those ones that would be the last one of the last ten that I sell when I I need you know a new organ or something. Okay, so <laughs> what's the very last one that you sell? If you if you if you take away emotional content, so if you're just like, man, I'm, I I don't want to get rid of this knife. It's probably gonna be my at, at A12. I have a Andrew Demko custom AD12. And they're pretty rare to get. And I think I've seen a cup, like maybe two other ones, even on the internet. So I like, and I like it as far as the way it feels in my hand. That's my favorite feeling. Andrew Demko knife is the eighty twelve. Eighty twelve. So that's that's a an eighty ten plus. Yeah, it's like an eighty ten with a kind of a curved handle, like a little bit of a sculptured handle. It's a little so, bit. So, wait, is that what the Formax was based on? It's, yeah, it's kind of like a eighty ten, it was a four max baby kind of thing. It's just it's just really a perfect kind of knife. It, it's pretty amazing, and I guess that probably the top five, four or five of my never sell knives are, are Demco. So okay. I just got that eighty twenty in right here. Yeah, what do you think of that? Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I'm gonna be getting more of these. This one right here. This is my, I, w I wish you would tell me it was horrible because oh no i can't i can't lie god I this love is it, it's so awesome it's so fidgety it's you know i i almost backtracked and said this was less fidgety than the scorpion lock but it's not this thing is awesome this is like andrew Demko made a i don't need a bench made kind of a that kind of axis lock fidgety knife and it's super strong and built and this is actually i don't know if you've seen but this is actually the first one ever made. Yes, yes, I saw and that. I love that, uh, and I lucked out on that too. They were they were kind enough to do that for me. So, what is your favorite of all of the? Uh, it, so it, it's the eighty twelve, is what you said. I was good. now if I had to take one knife out in the woods, I would take the four max. I, I love the four max. It's just about a perfect knife. But the eighty twelve, if you look at rarity and usability, that's definitely that's the one. So what are your top knives of 2020 so far? Formax Scout. That's the number one so far. I love the Formax Scout. 
I was hoping they would do that. Not not for me because I have four maxes, but for everybody that you know maybe can't come up with three or four hundred bucks. I love the four max scout, and, and it sounds like I'm just trying to make money for Lynn Thompson. But the SR1 light, man, that thing, that's you, so much like the SR1. Yeah, I would take two of those instead of buying one SR1. You know, or however much the SR1s are now. That thing's awesome. I love the SR1 light. You could get the clip point and the tanto for the price of a regular. There you go. So you'd have, yeah, you know, why even think of it like that? That's what I'm going to do. She's like, get off of here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I am kind of uh, ashamed to, to admit that I don't have a four max in any incarnation and, and haven't yet yeah. though. I have, you know, I have a very uh, robust cold steel collection and, uh, that I don't know why I don't know why I've never actually gotten that, and now that it's even more in reach, I feel I feel ashamed. <laughs> well, you know what? We get off of here. You send me your address. I'll send you one of these scouts oh, over here. No, 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 no. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do that. This is cool. I'm gonna send send you a scout. That'll oh. be my payola for being being on this <laughs> <your> podcast. <laughs> payola. Okay, you heard it right here, ladies and gentlemen. All right, cool. Well, that sounds good, and and I will I will give it a uh, I will give it a. A fantastic review, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Just... So I got a couple of questions from people uh, who were very excited. I was going to be talking to you. Uh, first, uh, do you give away your smoke recipe, your brisket recipe? Oh yeah, I don't have anything secretive there. It's. It, I think I did a video on it. It's. It's all pretty easy. It's all nothing. Right. Do you want me to give it? Uh, no, I, I was going to say. All right, check out the video. Yeah, there's a video out there. It's just really simple. Just. There's nothing I'm complicated or anything. It just ends up tasting good. So I just keep doing it. The other thing was, do you carry a Delica or do you have a Delica? Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't do that to myself. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm, I think I have a Delica in one of my bags, but I never was a big fan of the Delica. I didn't. I just didn't like the way it, the action on it as opposed to the heft of it. And it just felt like too much work to open and i know it sounds crazy just i you know if you look at my videos i'm just now two years into my spider co collection so i was never i never i had a delica and i've given a couple away i just wasn't one of my favorites yeah i i, I think that was a loaded question i think who, whoever asked that knew the answer but <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> you know what i've noticed is that uh i know if you really like a knife if it has a lanyard on it what's your thing with lanyards you know, I used to hate lanyards. When I first got into to knives and stuff, I was like, why, why are people doing that? And then I think I got a smaller knife that I, that I couldn't get my pinky on. So I ended up looking online and figuring out how to make a lanyard. And then it just got to be where I like shiny things like a raccoon, you know, colorful things on my black knives. And they're really useful. Let me see if I can. Well, this one's, you know, this is the bailout. So the bailout's long enough, but. If you have like a DPX heat or something, or a Hest, mm -hmm. or yeah, heat, but you need that extra pinky room there, it really, really helps out for somebody that's got wide, wider hands. And, and that's, it kind of comes to that. But then you look at, <laughs> you look at my, my 8020, it's got a pirate skull. It really has no use at all. But it just kind of, I like the way it looks. I just kind of different things. It, some of them have a use and some of them just, I think they look cool. Yeah, yeah, I I got gotcha. you with my. Uh, if I put a leather fob on it, that means like it's kind of mine. I'm not getting rid of it. It's, it's uh, it's kind of in the bank there. Um, but uh, so what? What are the kind of trends? What are the kind of things that you would like to see happening in the knife world? Um, and what do you think has been the prevailing trend that has led us to this point right here? I think. A lot of knife's popularity you can be due to the different series like you know Knife or Death or Forge and Fire. So that's really opened up a lot of the public to knives, and then they go searching for different knife things, and they and they find channels like ours, and then they start getting involved in knives and blade forms and whatnot like that. As far as trends, I I don't like the way it's just trending like we were talking about earlier towards the super steels like. Mm -hmm. We're looking for that next big one. I don't mind that, but you see somebody, people just garbage talking about stuff that really has no truth behind it. 
And I think it causes a lot of animosity towards towards budget knives that a lot of people, those are the only ones people can afford. And so you get people that don't want to say, hey, look, I got a Kershaw, you know, $20 Kershaw, I got this because of all the the, the stuff about super steals. I'd like to see, I don't know, it sounds weird talking about acceptance, but just like, hey, you know, yeah, you got S, S90V or, or Crew Max or whatever it is, but also also like the HCR because of the way it feels in my hand. I have a, a couple of knives. I have a, oh, what is it, the Boker Salako, one of my favorite knives. Yeah. And it's 440C, and I love that knife. That's one of my favorites. It fits good. It slices great. And, but people won't give it a shot. I've hmm. I put it on, you know, videos, and, and you'll see comments like, no, 440C just doesn't do for me. But they don't even have a chance. They don't understand what a great knife it is because, you know, 30 people over on such and such form have trash talked it and and they miss out on a lot i think a lot of people miss out on some really excellent knives because of and this the steel snobbery and it, that's i'd like to see that change yeah steel snobbery material snobbery i mean it, if i look at uh you know c crkt is always my big example but but Boker is also another good example um, of companies that bring you high design from people whose knives almost no one can afford. Uh, but there you can, like with Boker, for instance, one of my, uh, the only, uh, I have a couple of Bokers and one of them is a uh, Marlowe Squail. And Charles Marlowe is a very, very difficult knife maker to collect if, <laughs> unless you're, you know, uh, very, you know, unless you can spend a whole hell of a lot of money and time on one knife. Okay. Um, but the fact that you can go to a Boker or a CRKT and get it in 440C or in this case, uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. 440. Uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, I can, I can use that steel just fine. And for that knife to, to be able to have that design, have it in my hand, um, I, you know, who, I'm not a Rockefeller. I don't need all that. Right, exactly. Yeah, you, same thing with Brian Ty. You can get some of his CRKT stuff, and it's a great representation of what he can do with that button lock and the different, the different things he does. But like you said, you start looking at his custom stuff, and you're four figures in before you even get started with any kind of customizations on that. That, that might be actually where CRKT has it over kershaw they all they both have very large stables of inexpensive knives um and I, actually personally i've always uh, uh drifted towards kershaw and kai and zt uh but but in this conversation i'm realizing crkt has always offered the most in terms of budget high design you know uh gustav Ciccini for uh oh no I guess that was Kershaw. All right. Forget that. But uh, there are others. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. I look around my, my thing here and there are green boxes everywhere. I love CRKT. And they're one of those people that they're one of those companies that, you know, the snobs like to, to trash on. And I would never buy that. I'll never, I'll never get a CRKT. Why? You know, I don't understand the why not on that. Here, here's a question with, uh, we're, we're talking about, uh, steel and and brand snobbery but recently there's been uh a um uh you know sort of backlash towards usa produced knives not a backlash there's always been a, st a strong uh, prevailing trend in the u.s knife market to buy u.s made if you can afford it uh but recently especially with uh the pandemic and other things happening uh there there's been a lot of talk about you know, trying to only buy USA made in the knife industry. Um, how, where, how do you feel about that? These imports like we, uh, Riyadh, Reich, Kaiser, I mean, they make some impressive knives. I'm, I'm as patriotic and more patriotic than some. I'm all about the United States. But if you look at the people that are affected by that kind of attitude, you're looking at truck drivers. You're looking at companies that are based here in the United States. You're looking at people that are employed by places like Blade HQ, places like Smoky Mountain. All these people, all of a sudden, you only buy it. We're only going to sell you. You take it all the way to the extreme. All we're going to sell is United States knives. There are so many people that are affected by that. So 
Yeah, sure. They were made in China. And you can't go into that whole Chinese makes garbage knives anymore. That's that's a long, long time ago. I don't even know when that's that stopped because you like you said, Riot and We and Kaiser and all these guys, the the knives are fantastic. And they're make you got companies like Riot that are making knives for so many different makers outside that you know, you're making the Chavez knives and, and right. different things like that. So yeah, you can't go by quality, and I don't think you can go with that argument of buy USA because it affects so many people's livelihoods and because it's helping so many people inside the United States. And so while I'm patriotic and I can understand the the pandemic thing, this I, I'm not for the buy USA, you know, forget Chinese knives kind of thing. It's just it's ridiculous. I think it's a closing your eyes to the actuality of the problem or the issue. If you want to buy you want health United States? Yeah. Go, go to Smoky Mountain, go to Blade HQ, buy from then you're helping, you're helping Americans. And it sounds silly, but you are. Yeah. We, uh, we've heard that a bit on this show and it's an interesting, uh, there, there are many different ways of looking at it, but, uh, one, one sure thing is, is you buy from a Blade HQ or a knife center and that has a ripple effect. You know, Knife Center is located right here in Virginia, and there are people who sell coffee to the people who work at Knife Center, and there are people who do accounting at Knife Center, and there are truck drivers who deliver to Knife Center. And so kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're still helping. You're still doing your part. You're still buying domestic. And there's also the whole hypocrisy of uploading your hatred for Chinese knives on your iPhone. <laughs> so yeah. there's just you can't, you can't get away from it. And when you, if you did, it would affect us so negatively that uh, people wouldn't under, don't understand that. It's just a blind patriotism kind of thing. That's the worst kind of patriotism. Great. Well, you, you talk about the next generation before. So, uh, well, how do you feel about sharing um, knives and the love of knives and the knife hobby uh, with kids? I'm all for it. If you teach them safety, I'm all for it. Like I said, I get that one. Now that I've told you what year I got it. <laughs> I, I, but I got my 112 when I was seven. I don't. I may have cut myself when I was sharpening, but I never stabbed myself. Never stabbed anybody. I was taught the seriousness of it. I was taught, you know, how to use it. When am I supposed to use it? It's not a toy. Now I have, and I have two sons, and so I've been in the knives for a long time. Now neither of them are crazy about them like me, but they know. Hey, this isn't a toy. This this is. This is a tool and it's to be used. And if you care to collect, that's too, that's fine. But, you know, there's a serious side of it. And I think kids can understand that. I mean, we, I, I did, I'm not sure when you started, but yeah, I, I knew at a young age, this pointy edge doesn't go towards anybody. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you mentioned before uh, showing up to school, I think we're probably about the same age, uh, showing up to school with a knife on your belt and it not being a big deal because, Everyone knew you knew that you weren't a murderer. You know, you're not show, you're not some punk. You're just someone with a tool. And knowing that the sharp end doesn't go into a person is kind of like knowing not to stick a fork in an outlet. People just know it from an early age. Uh, but then when you get people all, you know, clutching their pearls and freaked out, uh, then, you know, life changes. Right. I think everybody's tend to take the corners off of everything, take, you know, put padding on all the walls yep. and you can't do that. And I think kids, well, I know, I know kids have more responsibility in them than they're given. You know, we've gotten, and I don't mean to get all political, but you get into schools where you can't play tag anymore and you can't play dodgeball and, and all these things. So they've this all come down to, you know, I had a cousin whose dad, was really scared of him having knives and so i don't think it it really helped him by being afraid i think it's more helpful to be informed than mm -hmm. it is to be terrified of something and it's easy to be terrified it's easy to not to to want them to have it so you know where are they at now what are they doing yeah. but you can't do that you can't you have to inform and then let it let it go at, at that point point. and that's yeah. my belief on knives yeah, I agree. I mean, anyone who has a child knows that uh, you think about the multitude of ways that things can go sideways every single day. You think of something horrible that oh, could yeah. happen. You know, that's yeah. part of what it is. Uh, but, you know, 
uh, I just gave my daughter who's, who just turned 10, I gave her her first Swiss army knife. And I know by now, you know, she's borrowed mine enough um, that she knows what she's doing. And when she, if she cuts herself, you know, that's a lesson. I've cut myself 8 million times. Oh, uh, yeah. And each time I've learned a little bit more about how much yeah. I hate getting cut. That's right. I'm 48 years old and I made a character on my channel by somebody that <laughs> by me cutting my finger. So I made a finger puppet. That's how many times I've cut myself. <laughs> so I'm still, I'm still cutting myself, man. It's just the way it is. You can either be super safe or you can just realize this is what's going to happen. That's right. All right. So uh, before we wrap this up, Josh, I would like to put you through my speed round so okay. that I can really get to know you. I mean, All these right. last uh, 55 minutes have just been uh, – you know, warm up to, to actually find out what you're all about. All right. All right. So, uh, fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud thumb stud washers or bearings washers mm -hmm. tip up or tip down, uh, tip up. That's so funny. Everyone knows what, what they mean, but everyone pauses because you right. never remember. <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tanto or Bowie? Oh, Tanto. Oh, that's interesting. First, first person to ever choose that, I think. Hollow ground or flat ground? Hollow ground. Full size or small? Full size. Uh, I should say full size or pocket chunker, but you're going to say full size. <laughs> uh, gentleman's knife or tactical? Tactical. Automatic or Bally song? Ooh, uh, automatic. Okay. ZT or we? We. Benchmade or Hogue? Benchmade. Huh. That's a good Real one, though. <laughs> Real Steel or Steel Will? Oh, uh, Steel Will. All right. Milled Titanium or Spring Clip? Uh, milled Titanium. Okay. Uh, carbon fiber or micarta? Carbon fiber. Uh, finger choil or no choil? Choil. Got to do the choil. <laughs> <laughs> For when, when you have giant meat hooks. That's right. right. I need everywhere, every space possible. <laughs> <laughs> form, <coughs> excuse me, form or function? Oh, function. And finally, your desert island knife. That's the one knife you get to keep for the rest of your life. So I'm on a desert island. I'm going to go with the Formax. The, uh, I would, if I was just going to keep a knife here in the house, it would be that 8012. But as far as needing a knife and having it, that Formax is awesome. Well, that's actually the answer to both questions because I say desert island knife, but then I always say you don't have to be on a desert island. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in that case, it works perfectly. We get the AD12 or the AD, you said 10, right? The 4Max. Oh, the 4Max. Yeah. All right. I should have known that. Uh, being a Jimmy Slash fan for four years. Uh, Josh, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and sitting down and just chatting knives with me. I really appreciate it. I love your channel. And uh, tell everyone where they can find you on uh, social media. Just look up the Jimmy Slash channel or Facebook group. Just type in Jimmy Slash. It'll be the only one there. Um, Jimmy Slash 13 on Instagram. And I think I'm the only Jimmy Slash channel on YouTube. So, <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first at Jimmy Slash. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. My pleasure.